The environment of space is an incredibly hostile place for humans and spacecraft alike. It is home to a variety of dangers that us humans are protected from here on Earth's surface. Any singular danger such as ionizing radiation, space debris, and extreme temperatures could jeopardize a mission. To protect crews and vehicles from these hazards, engineers have to balance a number of factors to properly mitigate each one. In the case of orbiting satellites, temperature controls are integral systems to maintain safe operations. Items exposed to the sun can see surface temperatures fluctuate as much as 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Something like the ISS, rotating around Earth so closely, can see these temperature fluctuations every 90 minutes. These temperature extremes are exactly why it's so important for engineers to design robust and innovative solutions for their spacecraft. This is SpaceCat Engineering, and in this video we'll cover the background and understanding of the thermal properties of spacecraft, and how their engineering systems protect them from the extreme temperatures of space. As a rule of thumb, I'll attempt to present these topics without diving too much into the math of it all. As a mechanical engineer by trade, even some of this stuff flies way over my head. Thermodynamics is a specialized branch of physics that deals with the energy and work of a system. In a generalized sense, across the universe, heat will always travel from a place where it is hot to a place where it is cold. For example, if you place a bucket of hot water in one location and a bucket of cold water in another, and then provide a means of which heat can be transferred between the two, then we will always observe heat flow from the hot bucket into the cold bucket. According to the second law of thermodynamics, irreversible heat transfer processes follow a concept called entropy. Entropy is essentially a measure of disorder within a system. And according to the equation, heat will always move from a low level of disorder to a higher level. This functionally provides a theory that for all elements within the universe, heat will naturally transfer from hot environments to cold environments. The funny thing about physics is that abstract concepts can be represented in everyday life. Ice cubes melting, popcorn popping, tea leaves diffusing into water. These are all examples of entropy. The funniest everyday example I can think of involves cables, like phone chargers or headphone wires. Researchers have actually done a tremendous amount of research into this. When you place your perfectly cold cable into your back pocket or backpack, there is exactly one orderly state this arrangement represents. But the moment you introduce energy into the system, by perhaps walking around, you develop discrete tangled states that the cord can evolve into. These states perfectly represent the near limitless combination of tangled messes the cord can arrange himself into. According to the second law of thermodynamics, then, it can be assumed that your headphone cord will always tangle up in your pocket as they transition from a more entropic environment with more disorder. On the grandest of scales, this concept of heat transfer can be observed via the cosmic microwave background radiation. As far back as the strongest telescopes can reach, this is the leftover heat originating from the Big Bang billions of years ago. As the universe expanded, this primordial heat cooled and dissipated into almost every reach of the universe. Today as it stands, this background radiation provides an almost universal heat constant of just 2.7 Kelvin. And by that I mean if you were dropped perfectly into the furthest reach of space, away from any stars and galaxies, you would eventually freeze to just 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. That was a long-winded explanation, but hopefully you understand the concept of heat now. Or really, the lack thereof. Now in general, there are three mechanisms to transfer heat. Conduction, convection, and radiation. However, in space, engineers exclusively focus on just conduction and radiation, typically. The overall structure of a spacecraft is usually dominated by conductive heat transfer, while to and from the outside environment is exclusively driven by thermal radiation. As you probably learned in school, conduction is a transfer of heat through physical contact. For spacecraft, this primarily occurs when onboard instruments transfer built-up heat into surrounding colder components. This thermal property is namely driven by temperature differentials, physical geometry, and the material properties of the craft. Radiation, on the other hand, is a transfer of heat through the electromagnetic spectrum. Unlike conduction, radiation does not need a medium to transfer heat. This form of energy transfer is the primary way energy is converted throughout the universe. And this form of energy is defined and derived from Stefan Boltzmann's laws. Instead of going through all the mathematical proofs, in general for spacecraft within the solar system, we can view these thermal transfers as a simplified formula. Essentially, for any spacecraft, it's governed by balancing the thermal loads. In general, satellites will experience radiation from the Earth-Moon-Sun system, in addition to the radiation from deep space like we previously discussed. In this diagram, we can see the background, the solar, and the albedo radiation loads representing the thermal inputs for this spacecraft. Additionally, the Q generation represents the conductive thermal load inputs from within the spacecraft itself. All of these loads are then summed together into the left-hand side of the equation, 
and they are then either stored to maintain the minimum operating temperature of the spacecraft, or they're rejected back into deep space. For the rest of the video, we'll cover how spacecraft balance these thermal loads. Essentially, all spacecraft utilize a combination of two different types of systems, passive and active thermal control systems. Active thermal control methods rely on input power for operation and have been shown to be more effective in maintaining tighter temperature control for components. However, they are often much more complicated and advanced than passive systems, so they're typically reserved for larger spacecraft. Active thermal devices often represent electric resistance heaters, cryocoolers, thermoelectric coolers, and coolant loops. These type of active thermal control systems come in all sorts of shapes and colors, but they're typically broken into three subsystems heat collection, heat transportation, and heat rejection. Using the International Space Station as my prime example, we can walk through each of the subsystems. The station primarily uses coolant loops, which on a simplified level consist of a circulating pump that moves liquid through tubing connected to heat exchangers and heat sinks. The process begins with heat collection, where each of the external cooling loops draws heat from two sources. Firstly, from the external heat exchangers located throughout the orbital platform, and secondly, through cold plates that draw heat from three external DC to DC converter units, otherwise known as DDCUs, and two main bus switching units, otherwise known as MBSUs. This heat is circulated throughout the station by a pumping module, which provides flow and accumulator functions that maintains proper temperature control at the pumping outlet. This heat is then rejected via the radiator system. These radiators, three on each loop, are attached to a thermal radiator rotation joint that can easily optimize their heat rejection efficiency based on the changing thermal environment of the station. For satellites not nearly as complex as the International Space Station, their thermal management systems are much simpler and require fewer components. They utilize a combination of features often including thermal straps, thermal storage units, deployable radiators, and sun shields. Sun shields are a special variant of passive systems. Take for example the James Webb Space Telescope. Its layered space shield is an incredible representation of the simplicity and incredible power of multi-layer insulation, otherwise known as Mylar. Mylar has been employed on virtually every manned and unmanned NASA mission. This is what gives many satellites and other space probes the appearance of being covered with gold foil. This effect is created by layering amber-colored Kapton layers over silver aluminized Mylar layers. This gives Mylar the unique property of being thin, flexible, and excellent at protecting spacecraft. As radiation from the sun represents the biggest external source of heat influence, multi-layered insulation is designed to maximize the reduction in both absorption and emission properties of radiation. Again, the functionality of Mylar is best represented by the James Webb Space Telescope. 1.5 million kilometers away, JWST's five-layered tennis court-sized sunshield acts like a parasol providing shade against the sun, earth, and moon. Its multi-layer design allows the unit to maximize its thermal efficiency. On the outermost layer, temperatures can reach up to 380 Kelvin, while the innermost layer can keep the telescope below 50 Kelvin. The heat radiates out between the layers, and the vacuum between the layers acts as an incredibly good insulator. It's actually insane that only a few inches of mylar is enough to create a 300 Kelvin difference. Zooming out on all this, it's always been challenging to understand physical concepts with our limited understanding of the universe. This universe, ever-expanding, filled with raging stars, and temperatures only a fraction above what is physically possible, has always inspired previous generations. We are constantly learning new and innovative ways to accomplish these space challenges, so while the math is infinitely more complex than what I presented, hopefully this video helped provide an understanding of the types of engineering challenges required to fabricate successful spacecraft. It's certainly not a one-size-fits-all solution, and new engineering materials and techniques are being developed every day for future 21st century space missions. As always, if you stayed this long through the video, please consider subscribing for more content. And be sure to check out some of my other videos in the links below.